Open your Bible tonight, if you will, to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter number two is where we're going to be tonight. Habakkuk chapter number two. Habakkuk chapter number two. Last week I had started a series, and the series was simply titled Topics That Keep Us Silent While the Bible Still Speaks. I um, was very adamant to be very plain, to be very clear. Of course, uh, many of you know that uh, there's a lot of things that's in our society that a lot of people talk about, they debate about, and they argue about. A lot of people will ruin their testimony trying to prove themselves to be right, but at the same time, they're forgetting that even though they can argue and they can debate better than others, everything they, don't, they say don't always line up with the Word of God. And what we need today, more than anything, is not what people say and, and really not even what spiritual heroes say. We definitely don't need what the government says. What we need is what the Word of God says, and it's plain, it's plain. And uh, last week we talked about some principles, and uh, I, I know they uh, seem to be, as I said last week, about different things, about uh, the stumbling and the stuff, stuff that goes on. You know, we argue about these things that are quote-unquote, and I know this is debatable, what I talked about last week, that are gray areas. And there's no such thing as a gray area with God. It either pleases God or it don't. But he's talking about the expedience of these things, about, you know, whether or not it draws us closer to God or away from God. Because this is what a lot of people say, and a lot of it's out of pride, and it's resentment, and it's rebellion. They don't want to hear what somebody says because uh, it, gets, it gets them frustrated, and, and they always hear somebody being negative. And I can understand that because we have abused sometimes uh, the opportunity to be able to speak to people. But even though that's the case, what they forget is even though it might not be black or white as a chapter in verse in the Bible, then you must understand there is a principle of expedience. So in other words, does this draw you closer to the Lord? Does that friend draw you closer to the Lord? Does that activity, does that place draw you closer to the Lord? Or does it pull you away from the Lord? And you cannot debate that. And the tragedy, the sad part of all of that is typically none of us really never ever really understand it or see it until afterwards. Uh, we, we sit there and we assume and we have assumed and we've been wrong. I'm going to be honest with you. But a lot of times we never really realize, oh, that was not good. Those people were not good. That activity was not good. That, that choice was not the best choice until afterwards. And you realize that it cost you something. So we talked about some principles to be able to live by. And the reason why that mattered is because these are things that people debate all the time. So we just choose to be silent. We either go left or we go right. We either get dogmatic, hard, and mean about what we believe or we just keep our mouth shut and we're passive. And I believe, as the Bible says, that there is a balance, and that balance is speaking truth in love. I believe it 100%. It always honors the Lord, but it's always with the Spirit that God gives you to be able to speak that. Now, you believe that tonight, say amen. I mean, that's the key. You got, you got to know. You can say the right thing, but it must be in love. So tonight brings us to a very, very hot topic. I prayed about a number of things that God would have us, done a lot of study, and uh, the Lord just kept let, leading me back here to this place. I want to read a few verses tonight, Habakkuk chapter number 2, and I'll start reading in verse number 15, and then I'll give you a title after we read a few of these verses. Starting in verse number 15 of Habakkuk 2, the Bible says this. It says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. That puttest thou, that puttest thou, thy bottle to him, and make, makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look upon their nakedness. Thou art filled with shame for glory, drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee and spoil the, and the spoil of the beast, which made them afraid because of the men's blood, and for the violence of the land, of the city, and of all that dwell therein. I want you to go back in verse number 15 and notice what the Bible says again. It says, Woe unto him, woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. Tonight, for a few moments, I, I want to be able to talk about, from a whole different perspective, about just a simple drink, alcohol. 
You know, a lot of times we don't talk about it. Matter of fact, we want to get up and walk away because it's like we're beating this dead horse. But I think it's something we ought to discuss. If it was not important you to let your children drink and drive anytime they wanted to. If it did not matter, you would take a fifth of liquor and you would drink it before you got behind the wheel and drove down the road. So you listen to me tonight before we just kind of be dogmatic and say, well, I, I don't want to hear. The Bible has an answer for every single question that we have. Now, we can go to the New Testament, we can talk about, we'll get there tonight, and there's a lot of things that we can see, and typically, because we understand that now that we're living in, in these days of the church, that's usually the approach, but I believe when you look back in Scripture, from the beginning to the end, and by the way, the Old Testament is just as valid and up-to-date and needed and part of the Bible as what the New Testament is. They will never contradict each other, they always go in line with one another, they're always going to agree with one another, and and everything you read in the Bible in its context, understanding the definition of it, you will know whether it has words like strong drink or wine or, 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 or anything else. Every one of them, they have a meaning to them and you have to study those things out. Just because you and I use terminology today does not mean that was the same terminology that they used back in those days. But right here, it is black and white. And it's literally talking about a drink. So when you come to this text to understand that God is dealing with the Babylonians. And he's judging them. And, and there's five areas that he is, he's dealing with them. And this is the fourth area that he really puts his finger on. And as you look in here, you begin to read. And you'll see that, that God's view about alcohol is not the same as today's society. We live in a day, and this is not just in the world. I'm talking about in the church, matter of fact. Matter of fact, uh, let me just kind of help you. We got uh, Baptists, Independent Baptists. We got Southern Baptists. We, we've got Primitive Baptists. I mean, we got all kinds of Baptists. I, I ain't even going to go down the other denominations. Everybody kind of split. Well, now there's this now Reformed theology. And it's amazing how when somebody don't agree with somebody else, they just create their own little group. And, and I'm not saying that we're right about everything. I mean, I'm not here to be able to say that I know everything and I've got it all figured out and, and I'm against everybody. No, what I care about more than anything else is that you know Jesus Christ is a personal Savior. That's what I care about the most because at the end of the day, if you don't line up with our doctrine, you're just not going to preach here and we're probably not going to preach there. But what I care about is when we get to heaven, let's figure it all out, but let's just make sure we all get to heaven together amen so that's what I care about I, I'm not here to argue but here's what happens Christians disagree and brother Stephen what they do is they come up with a new denomination and they just break away they do this and, and listen it's not just a new denomination it's even in the midst of the independent Baptist churches I mean you got independent Baptist churches that are divided on independent Baptist churches and they're independent but it's like they're all together and then they're all together and they're all together but they're all independent I mean if I was lost I would have a hard time trying to understand the church today too can I get a witness right there I mean it'd be hard and I can remember when I was 22 years old trying to figure out what truth was. And then 23, all I knew is I needed the Lord. And I don't care what church I went to. And I'm not saying this to be ugly. And I'm not promoting Episcopalian. And I'm not promoting Catholic or non-denominational or Nazarene. I did, as long as I heard the gospel, all I knew is I needed to get saved. That's what I knew. And when I got saved, watch me now. A preacher didn't change me. A mom and daddy didn't change me. Somebody didn't push it down my throat and force me to believe no when I heard the word of God I went to the back of my Ryrie Bible that my aunt bought me and I made my own little list of little scriptures about every single situation life so therefore I didn't get up and say well my mama said and my daddy said and my preacher said no this is what the Bible says about every matter so tonight I want to help you and I will tell you this is personal to me and it's not because it's just something that I've got an agenda. It's because it's personal. I, I have the scars. I, I'm not preaching at you. I, I, I've been in homes and I, I've lived a life where I unfortunately am too familiar with this one thing. And I have seen heartache after heartache after heartache. So when you come to this text, you begin to see that God is judging them. Now, if God judges the Babylonians for the way that they was to promote this and put it out, I want you to think about what God's going to do today. Have you ever thought about this? 
all these folks that are on TV, these amazing stars, these athletes, these movie stars, all of these people that get on TV and they're, and I'm not being ugly, they're in their bikini, they're walking around like they're the best thing since sliced bread and they got a six pack and an eight pack and they're just sitting out on the boat and they're drinking some kind of alcohol. It's amazing how they promote these things. And here's my question though, if God judged the Babylonians for doing that, how much more you think he's also going to judge them? And, you know, we preached about this last week. You can argue me all you want to, but when the Bible tells us not to be a stumbling block to our brother, that, that means there, there may be a place, you might be okay, y- y'all might remember me talking about this, we go to a ball game. When me and Brother Charlie used to go to a ball game when I first got saved, we went to go tailgate. Man, when we went to go tailgate, it was fine, but it was new to me because when you get there, Brother Travis, everybody didn't have to be partying, they didn't have to drink. Watch me now, you could go to the game and remember the game and enjoy it. I mean, really, you know, so I'm like going, and, and we're over here, man, they're cooking hot dogs, and we got crab legs. I mean, I'm talking about, man, I'm born again, saved on my way to heaven, and bless God, I'm eating crab legs, and I'm about to go to a football game. I mean, it don't get no better than that, does it? And, and but the point is, is sometimes in that environment, if I know that Brother Charlie is tempted in that environment, watch me now, I should not put Brother Charlie in that environment. A Christian knows not to do that. Here's why. You don't want to make them stumble. If you love the Lord, you don't want to make them stumble. If you love your brother and sister in Christ, you do not want to make them stumble. So the key is, is we must know this does affect our families and our homes. So I say that because, as I mentioned, I am 100% serious about this because of what the Bible says, but also because of what I've personally witnessed in my own life. Stay with me tonight. I want you to look back in verse number 15. We're going to pick out a few things tonight. The Bible says this, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor to drink. First thing you write down tonight is drinking alcohol causes suffering. The, the one issue, I mean, that you cannot debate is that drinking alcohol, it causes suffering. The Word of God, the Bible says, if you notice that, the first word, woe. You know what that word is? It's judgment. It is destruction, if I can say it that way. I mean, we're talking about God makes it plain that there is destruction because of alcohol. God's not tiptoeing. And let me say this, unless God is a liar, and unless you can prove anywhere in the Scripture that He ever contradicts Himself and, and, and lies about something, you don't need another chapter and verse except for that one verse to be able to know by definition of what the Bible says that God made it plain that alcohol will lead to destruction. There is suffering that comes from alcohol. You can't debate that. It's not a personal opinion. It's not what I said. It's not what somebody else said. It's what the Bible says. So if we're going to debate it, we have to debate it. Now watch me. Again, you could throw 50,000 scriptures at me. You and I can go back and forth on so many different things. But unless you hear what I said before, you're going to miss it all. God never contradicts himself. It's like we're looking for a reason to discredit the Bible as if we're smarter than what God was and we know more than what God does. No, if the Bible says it's wrong and it causes suffering here in the book of Habakkuk, chapter number 2, then nowhere you look from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation are you ever going to find that it's okay with God. God says they're suffering because of alcohol. There's so much to be known by this. Do you know, can I share this with you? There's statistics that's given that they say between 11 and 17 million uh, alcoholics live in America. 17, almost 17 million alcoholics live in America. When you look at it, they justify as politicians. We're in an election year, and they say one of the greatest things about alcohol is the fact that you can tax because it's a money maker, right? Because, of course, if you tax it, everybody's buying alcohol, everybody's doing it. Let me say this, friend. When they brought alcohol in Cracker Barrel, y'all better help me preach right here. When they brought alcohol in Cracker Barrel, you know they, they was getting close to Grandma's table. Can I get a witness right there? I thought to myself, I mean, I go in there for that roast beef, and I like that slaw, and man, you can get those turnip greens, and you can get some fried okra, and then all of a sudden they got alcohol sitting right there with you. And, uh, and I'm not being silly, but I'm just saying that is the pull, that's the draw on it. It's about money. But watch me now, as sure as there's money to be made, they don't tell you about the money that's lost. 
Let me tell you why. They say that $68.6 million a year is literally lost because of alcohol, whether it be people with physical problems, people of job loss, people that cannot work a job because they are too much in a drunkard state or they cannot get up and go to work or it's consumed their life, or car accidents of things and people that have accidents without insurance, $68.6 million it costs. So I would dare say to you that you ain't making that much money off of taxes when it comes down to it. It's costing us a lot of money. Why? Because no matter what you do, financially, physically, mentally, social, uh, 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 psycho, uh, whatever, uh, whatever that word is, psychologically, all those things, amen, all those things it's going to cost you there's going to be suffering that you're going to deal with watch me now they say 20,000 people die every single year because of alcohol in a car they say literally that 21 uh, 20 every 21 minutes somebody dies because of alcohol do you know the leading cause of babies that have a mental handicap if everything that you deal with comes from a mom who drank alcohol. So all of these issues that these children are being born with, they say that the leading cause is because a mother was pregnant and consumed alcohol. And friend, you understand as well as I do, I mean, it might have been a drop, okay? But I'm talking about it has taken their life. So now you've got these precious little babies like Miss Shannon's holding right there, and they're raised their entire life with this pain. And what is that? Whoa, this suffering that is in their life. But here's the key. God said it's the way that it would be. They said in fires all across America, whenever a fire happens and there's fatalities and things that happen, they say that 83% of those fires are because of alcohol that's in the home. In other words, they can put it back to where there was something that's done. They traced it to somebody that could not get out. They were either drunk, they consumed alcohol, something that was done, and they did not know how to function. 83%. Now, I know dying in a fire is hard. Can I just say this to you? I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to prove to you. I'm not trying to change your mind because I'm going to tell you and I understand this until God gets a hold of your heart like he does me and everybody else. It matters not. But I want you to tell you this is God's word, not man's word about alcohol. So these numbers are reality. They say that 68% of drownings have to do with alcohol. People go out on the 4th of July, and, and there they are. They're out there living it up and doing everything that they would do. And, you know, and, and they're setting off fireworks, watching fireworks, getting off to be able to have a little swim. 68% out of all of it, if, there, if there's 1,000 drownings in a year, then 680 of them, they say, is because of alcohol. Friend, you can't lie about these things. You can't add it up. I want you to listen to this. There's a man by the name of William Gladstone. He was the former prime minister of England. And this is what he said. And we're talking about suffering. One word, watch me now. One word of the Bible tells you where God stands about alcohol. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's suffering, it's suffering, it's suffering. Listen to this. He said, drunkenness expels reason. Drowns the memory. Distempers the body. Diminishes strength. Inflames the blood. Causes internal and external wounds. It is a witch to the senses, a devil to the soul, a thief to the purse, a beggar's companion, a wife's woe, and a children's sorrow. You know what I believe? I believe every word that he said is true. You want to know why? Because alcohol always causes suffering. I want you to think about this. How many times could something happen and you realize that that could have been my child, could have been my family? How many times do you realize driving down the road, y'all help me right here, when I, when I live with Aunt Billy, she says 9 o'clock, if, if it ain't going on at 9 o'clock, you don't need to be doing it. I tell my son to be home at 9 o'clock, and he looks at me like, you know, leave it to Beaver still on the, on the TV. You know, so I'm like, no, son, 9 o'clock, I tell you 9 o'clock, you be home at 9 o'clock. 
Aunt Billy be sitting at the door looking at the glass window, making sure that you're going to be home at 9 o'clock. But you know what? She's true. She's, she, was, she was right about it. And it wasn't so much about us, but how many of you know it's also about other people? They're out there. They've been having a good time. They've had a business meeting. They've come out from a long day. They're exhausted mentally. They go in. They have a few drinks with their friends. Before you know it, they're already tired. They're driving down the road. Watch me now. They're not somebody that's sitting over in the corner. They're not homeless people. They're not doing something. These are business women and business men. And they're driving down the road. And by driving down the road, they're so tired, exhausted, pulled in a thousand ways. They're a person of title. They have a position. And they come across the line and your innocent child, teenager, 17, 18, 19 years old, not really an experienced driver, see somebody come over, they don't know what to do. It's either head on, they jerk it, they overturn, they flip a couple times and it's all because somebody else was drinking and not because of them. I remember when I lived in, in Charlotte, I, I'll never forget, baseball season had just began. And, and right before that, it was wrestling season. And, uh, there were some guys, and, and we were on the wrestling team. And then boys had not yet come over to the baseball team. And, and uh, they were still in the States, and they were going and doing some things. where They were leaving that day, and they were driving down the road, and there was a curve. And, and uh, they got in the curve. and got a little bit too fast, and they got a little bit too fast and went around the curve. Just went off just slightly. There was a couple boys that were sitting in the back of that truck and, and just a little bit off the road. I mean, I, we're not talking about a major, major uh, accident or problem. But when he did, he overcorrected. They went airborne. They hit a tree. They hit it head on. The boys in the back, it used them like a slingshot and threw them against the tree. And lives were taken just like that. You want to know why? Because of alcohol. Because of alcohol. And I'm going to say this in the position that I am. To hear how many people's lives are affected by alcohol. And they never thought sitting in this church it would ever affect their family until all of a sudden it did. And then they got the phone call or they got the door knock. And what they thought would never come in their house ended up being in their very front door. And you don't think it can happen to you, but it can. The other night when I got up early that morning, I get up extremely early as you know. And that young man's accident was actually at 3.30 a.m. That's about the time that I wake up. A little bit after that, a little bit before, right around that time. So it wasn't long after that that this young man driving down Stratford Road, just being out, watching out, with some fellow individuals in the same field, professional field that he's in. He was, watch me now, not out for a party. He was out for fellowship. He was out with people that he co-labored with every day. And because of the pressure to exceed and to excel in his profession, right? He chose to rub shoulders. Now watch me now. These men, Brother Neil, they're older than him. These are people that have been doing this a while. And, and the pressure in life, not because they're kids. Watch me now. All peer pressure is not from teenagers, this young man's wanting to be like them, Brother Travis. He, he, he's, he's wanting to be able to grow up and, and want to be able to do and have the impact that they do. So because of that, he, he tries to settle in and, and tries to be a man with them. But in that time, what happens is he don't realize he's 19 years old. That in one or two hours, what he's doing right now is going to affect him right then, Brother Mark. He gets in the car and he begins to come home. He tried to wait a while and he waited. He waited. He, he tried to, watch me now, he tried to let it just simmer down. He, he tried to let it just kind of get out of his system. So he stopped. He didn't just keep going, but it was what he had an hour ago. Can you imagine? Live right over here. Can you imagine getting the phone call? Are you, are you Jason Holly, Nolan Holly's father? I'm over here on Stratford Road, and your son has been in a bad accident. He is alive. The car is totaled, but you need to come quickly. Can I tell you something? I don't know if I need to be behind the wheel getting there. Waking up, I, I don't, why, why? My whole life, my whole life is right there. My whole life. Now, I, I'm going to say this. This is me. This is me. I, I, I'm not giving you Bible and I'm not preaching opinion. One of my reasons for not drinking is because I know I cannot expect my son to do something that I don't do myself. 
That's just me. And watch me. I'm far from a perfect man. I am not your example. I am far. But I'm telling you, and here's why. Because I have been in his shoes. I have seen the way that it's affected families and parents and all of those things. And I'm just going to say this and leave it right here. That door was opened up to me when I was a child. It, listen, until I was about seven or eight years old, I thought all the things of life that was happening was just normal, Miss Vicky. I mean, I thought that's just the way mom and daddies lived. Everybody understand? I mean, like, I was just like, this is what, this is what happens. You know what I'm saying? This is what we do right here. But so many tragedies, so many broken homes. And I guess the main question is this, is, is, is have you ever thought that really it could be you, it could be one of your precious children? Because the key is, is this, no matter how you look at it, biblically and by experience, alcohol causes suffering. It causes suffering. You know what that young man told me? Brother Jason, one drink. One drink. Well, you know, watch me now. I, and I love this. I love this. And, and you, you're going to have a hard time arguing with me. And I'm talking about outside the pulpit. Because this is what everybody says. I can handle it. But you remember when you couldn't handle that first drink, but then you got handling it. And then you handle that second drink. So what happens is you can't handle that first drink. Oh, yes, I can. If you could handle it, you would stop right there. But you don't. And then what happens is you go for the next time, you're in a serious business meeting, you sit down, you get your drink. Man, I need to get me two in me. Why? Because I can handle it, but now I can handle two. So then I can handle three. Now your, your blood alcohol level is, is 0.16, and I guess you can still handle it. You can never handle the first drink because that's where it starts. How many times does it take to get pregnant? One time. Now it ain't going to happen. Really? I, I, and listen, I'm not being silly. I'm not trying to be inappropriate. I, I'm telling you right now, this is how it happens. We justify, but we forget. Alcohol causes suffering. Second thing, write it down. Alcohol causes shame. Oh, the suffering's not enough. The shame, oh, it does. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says this, same verse, verse number 15. It says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look upon their, what? Nakedness. God ties alcohol with immorality. He puts the two of them together. He literally says it's like one and then the other. Nakedness. That is a place of, of, of shame. I, I mean, you know, I, I understand we're living in a day and age, and this is what y'all say. Well, people just ain't got no shame no more. Now, y'all ain't even got to be spiritual to say that. Can y'all give me an amen? I mean, y'all know I'm telling it right when I say, you know, people ain't even got no shame no more. You know, they just walk around and do whatever. You ain't got to be saved to say that. And here's what we're saying. We're saying, Look at the way they're carrying themselves. This is what the Bible's saying. The Bible says that when you have alcohol, it's like that shame. They're tied together. You look at them, and it, it brings something upon you that, that you should not be showing. It should not be seen in your life. It brings a feeling to you and a dishonor to you that is not there unless you choose it for yourself. Shame. So he tells us, it's like nakedness. Then notice, notice, if you will, verse number 16, he says this. He says, thou art filled with shame for what? Glory. Shame for glory. And then he goes on and he says this. He says, drink thou also and let thy foreskin be uncovered. He said, the, the cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned upon thee and shameful. Watch these words. Spewing shall be on thy glory. So now he's saying when you get this place, you will be vomiting your own glory. And I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm not trying to be inappropriate. Forgive me for saying that from the pulpit. But that's what spewing means. You're literally going to be vomiting in your glory. That, that, that's, that's what you're putting out there. So you're, you're doing these things thinking everything's going to be fine. But what's going to happen It's going to take you down a path that you never thought that you would go down. And it's going to cause you more scars and more shame than you ever thought in your life. That's what happens. We're living in a day you turn on every single TV channel. 
And when it has something that has to do with alcohol, it is tied with what? All of these things that happen about beauty and being handsome and, and all these things. And they have their bodies and they're revealing everything. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, almost, it's almost like you getting a Twinkie and wearing a bikini and saying, this Twinkie's going to make me look this good. I mean, I mean, I'm not, I, but you, you understand, these people get paid a lot of money for marketing. Am I telling it right? So to an innocent child, an innocent child is watching this. A teenage boy, a teenage girl, and y'all don't have to amen me. I just preached to myself tonight. I'm telling you, I've, I've lived here. In the back of your mind, you're thinking, boy, I wish I could cut a rug like that. You know, you're watching that little thing and, you know, kind of cutting the rug. It, kind of like Neil does, you know, that's how he does it. He cut a rug a little bit. Or maybe I'll look like that. Or, or maybe, maybe, maybe my beach trip will be like that. Or maybe my, my boat ride will be like that. Or, or maybe my wife or my husband will look like that. Maybe that, that's what I need. Maybe that's what I'm missing. I'm too starchy. I'm too, I'm too sold out for the Lord. I, 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 I just, I, I'm doing too many things the narrow way. Maybe if I just loosen it just a little bit, it'll be all right. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says when you do that, you're going to put yourself in a situation. Before you, do, you, before you know it, you're going to cause everything to come against you, and the honor that you have is going to be done and gone away with. It, it, it's like you go out to these bars, to these clubs, to these homes, whatever it may be, and you take every bit of honor that you have in your life. By the way, can I tell you something? Before you ever compromise to a friend, if they like you and they love you, they loved you for who you were, not who they want you to be. And it's amazing how we feel like we have to partake in what they do to be accepted when the truth be told, they were our friend long before we ever did it. And, and watch me now, and you know what it is? Because there's a lot of old-time churchgoers, that's my generation, they're looking for a reason to find a hypocrite. Hey Amen, I'm preaching it straight, friend. They're looking for, oh yeah, I, I knew brother so-and-so, I knew, I knew he wasn't awesome. If his God was that big, oh, so you go call me out, but the other day you weren't really worried about that one or two drink that you had when he's over at brother, uh, brother so-and-so's house. So now all of this honor that you had where people used to say, if, if, if something happens, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call Erica to pray for me. I, I, I'm going to call Brother Louie to pray for me. I mean, you are the person. But then one moment, everything that you poured into them is now broken and shattered because you're just like them. You're just like them. You can say what you want, but let's take it outside for a moment. One of the hardest things to ever do, just like a parent, is be a dad. Watch this now. Be a daddy, and your children never look at you like a daddy. To be a mommy, and then your children never look at you like a mommy. Why? Because you've been dethroned from the opportunity to invest in their life. Same thing in the world. You were that friend, and then in that moment, and you can say what you want, but that same emptiness of failure, shame. I let somebody down. I can't tell you how many husbands and wives that I've talked to. And he has an issue because she talks a lot. She argues a lot, Brother Wayne. She's feisty. And he's in there like, preacher, you just need to tell her. She needs to respect. She needs to submit. And the truth be told, this gentleman is a good man. He never raises his voice. He maybe never does anything wrong. But she looks over the way and says, you know what? Well, if we're just going to be honest, yeah, I might get upset. I might be mad. But what about that drink you got every once in a while? You just lost every bit of credibility you had. And then you know what it turns into? Brother Keith, it turns into pride. Or who are you to call me out? I mean, now all of a sudden it's right. Whose sin is worse? Everybody's sin is bad. You don't know why? Alcohol causes shame. Marriages are still broken because of alcohol. Marriages get destroyed because of alcohol. I mean, it's just the way it is. The Bible speaks of this over and over. Let, let me share this with you real quick. The Bible says this, talking about the shame. The Bible says in the book of Hosea, chapter number 4, verse number 6, it says, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee. 
that thou shalt not be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, and I also will forget thy children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. Notice how he speaks. So what he's saying in these first two verses is, your leaders, you used to be in charge, but now, here's now, I, I have no more respect for you. I am rejecting you. I am, I am turning my back on you. You are supposed to be in a position to be able to help, but I'm no longer going to do this. Watch what the Bible says in verse number 8. It says, they eat up the sin of my people, and they set, and they set their heart on, uh, on their iniquity. And there shall be like people, like priests, and I will punish them for their ways, to reward the, uh, them for their doing. For they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom. They shall not increase because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. Notice verse number 11. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. He says, I'm just rejecting everybody because of the hurt. Now, because everything is all about the whoredom and the drinking and everything else, I am pushing it away. Why? There's shame that gets brought in. And we're not talking about average people. We're talking about somebody that's supposed to have a position. Somebody's supposed to have a leader. Y'all help me tonight. I mean, y'all understand? These are our children. I mean, I got an 18-year-old boy right now. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't give a plug nickel. I don't care if it's a politician, a preacher, whatever it may be. If he And, and listen, and they could be better than me. But if, they, if they're going to do something, I don't want my son's role models to be somebody that's going to take him down a path that don't show him the end of the path. I don't want that. And here's why. Because his daddy can stand up and say, son, Words that kids never want to hear. I've been there. I have done that. And they never, it's like they never want to hear it. Right? So what we do is we do everything we can to be their role model. The Bible tells us this in the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah chapter number 28. Listen to this. But they also, and you can write these references down. There's a lot of Bible. But they also have erred through wine. Did you hear that? They've erred through wine. And, and, and through strong drink. Now we've got strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. I mean, the Bible's telling you that these people have knowledge and wisdom and they can't even make the right choice. Can I ask you something? What makes you and me any better than them? I, I'm, I'm just, what makes us better than that? In the world, listen, so many people it's like Christians don't want to talk about because we're afraid to offend somebody. Can I just say this to you? From the, from the pulpit, to every one of y'all in here, every one of our family somewhere down the line has been affected by alcohol. We all have something in common. This is not a judgmental. This is, this is not me throwing stones. I ain't got, I've got no, throw, no stones to throw. But I'm telling you, we have to see truth. We have to see truth. Our families are being hurt and destroyed and, and mocked and, and our kids are being just overtaken by, I, I, um, my son, man, God forgive me. My son, this was a couple months ago, this boy used to play baseball with, he said, Dad, I want to go over to so-and-so's house. Well, I know so-and-so and I know his daddy. And I said, all right, well, they're going to be over there. He said, yeah, we're going to be over there. I said, okay. So who all is going to be over? I ask about 50 questions. I don't care. If you don't like it, it means he's hiding something. Okay? Well, he goes over there. Daddy's over there, Miss Ashley. They get over there. Watch me now. Dad comes downstairs. He's a big old fellow. And boys, put your keys over here. If y'all going to drink, just drink right here at the house. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I love Jesus. But I, I, I would sign my resignation letter. I'm telling you, I love my son. To be able to think that somebody had the audacity. To think that he, he's just going to, sir, he's just going to drink it at your house. I mean, that's like, that's like, me, that's like me getting a piece of bubble gum, Brother Randy, and be like, I'm just going to eat it in the store. No, I'm going to get bubble gum. And when you got it, you can be like, you want a piece of, absolutely, I want a piece of bubble gum. You know, I mean, it's like this is how we've got. And we justify it. Watch me now. Hey, Dad, are you going to be in the car with them boys when they're drinking and driving? 
Are you gonna are you gonna be there when they're around mixed company and them girls are there and he's the Bible has tied whoredom with with drinking and now all of a sudden we have a lot of uh, temptation might be the best word to be able to use. And are, hey, Dad, are you gonna be there too? Are, are you gonna be there when the knock comes at the door and she's pregnant by somebody's son? Why? Not because they chose they was not in the right mind. You're right, Dad, but you introduced them to it. Do you understand? What They're scars. This is deep. It's deep. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs, chapter 20, verse number 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. It's not wise. I want to read this, and then I'll, I'll move on tonight if I can. I'll give you my last point. If I can, let me have somebody just come to the piano. Keep your Bibles open, though, real quick. Proverbs 23. Guys, if you can put it up there, I'd like for them to be able to see this. Proverbs 23 is, is, as a father, maybe, may, maybe, maybe about my most important scripture to me and convicting of anything else. I want you to notice, let's pick up reading for the sake of time, verse number 19. The Bible says, hear thou, my son. You see, it's, all, it's already in the home. Talking to a son, notice what he says. Hear now, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Can you imagine the encouragement looking at your son, your daughter, trying to encourage them? Verse number 20, be not among wine bibbers, among rich, uh, right, richous, uh, righteous eaters of flesh. You know what he's saying right here? He's saying, whatever you do, look me now, look me now, chapter and verse. Remember what he said? There's two different sides of it. There is the law, and there's whatsoever is expedient. You remember we talked about that last week? The law says, be not among wine bibbers. Anybody want to debate that? That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Now, now here's the key, okay? Am I saying you drop your friend? No, I've got some of my best friends. I go see people. I got family that I go to their house, Miss Vicky, and they could be drinking, and they'll never pick it up out of respect for me. Not that I'm somebody. I thank God, and I'm not going to quit going over there and loving on them. I'm not saying turn your family away. Y'all stay with me now. Don't get quiet on me. I mean, it's all right. Everybody's good. But here's the thing. The day that the people that I'm attracted to the most are the party animals, more than it is God's people, that's a priority problem. You say what you want. We can make times to give a go hang out with every party and every get together, but we can't do church functions. Priorities. The Bible says, keep reading. The Bible says after that, verse number 21. For the drunkard and the glutton, there it is, shall come to poverty. And drow uh, drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Hearken unto thy father that beget thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. He's talking here, okay? He he here's the key. They're saying, uh, in other words, don't, don't turn away. Just, it's not like people are just old, <laughs> It's not an old saying. You understand? It's not like, oh, they're just old. They don't understand. They're out of date. No, the Bible says that you ought not to be around this mess. It's not, it's not because I'm old. Your parents need to take this and, and put it in your Bible. That way you give you, your kids not a, I said so, but give them a Bible. Are y'all with? I mean, I'm going to tell you right now, friend, I mean, there's a lot of things, but you make your kids mad and they get mad, they're going to go do what they want to do. But if you can give them Bible, watch me now, they're going to realize when you and I fail, because we're going to fail, they have a chapter and verse. They have a chapter and verse. Then notice what he says in verse number 23. Buy the truth, sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. He says in verse number 24, the father of the righteous, uh, righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that uh, begatteth a, a wise child shall have joy of him. The Bible says in verse number 20. Uh, for 25, the father and thy mother shall be glad, and she shall bear thee, shall rejoice. In other words, when you, when you do what you're supposed to, there's rejoicing. But when you get involved in this stuff, it brings broken hearts, no rejoicing. Hey, Aunt Billy, I'll say this loosely. All those kids that came up in your house, how many sleepless nights did you have? Mama's the same goes for you. Kids being out, wandering the road. There's no rejoicing in that mama's heart. 
She's worried sick. Is that 3.30 phone call going to come? I got nothing to be happy about. Notice this. Let's keep reading. The Bible says this. Here it is. Dads, hey, write this down. Moms, write this down. This verse right here, verse number 26. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Let me ask you a question. If they really are following you, where are you taking them? What are they doing? What are they doing? What are they doing? I go back to our text as they begin to play, and I'll give you a third thing and be done tonight. I'm finished. Thank you for your time. Not only alcohol brings suffering and alcohol bring shame but lastly write this down alcohol can be stopped drinking alcohol can be stopped it can be you know I heard that song a walking miracle a talking miracle y'all know what I'm talking about come on now maybe it didn't sound like me singing it but you know what I'm talking about it's a good song you know what some of you tonight and I, I'm not saying this because of the shame the shame you can get up and sing that song because you know who you used to be, but it is truly a miracle that God took some things out of your hand. Some of you have a strong marriage tonight because God took it out of your hand. Some of you, when you were kids, all you heard was cussing and fighting and fussing, beer bottles being thrown, but the home you live in today don't have those noises. You know why? Because it's not in your hand. It's not in your hand. And tonight you have so much to be thankful for. But here's how you got there. Watch this now. Not by a preacher getting up and saying, you're an idiot and you're going to die and go to hell if you drink. No. It's because he showed you from the word of God where God said, this is the end of the story. God softened your heart, made you realize it wasn't a mom or dad that was in your ear. Can I say this? I love my mom and dad. I love them. Only one I got. But I, I can't tell you that I remember a Christmas when I was a child with my parents when I don't remember alcohol. I, I can't remember a birthday party. Matter of fact, I can remember more Christmases when I was young, seven years old when they divorced. I can remember more Christmases when I was young that they were still up, Brother Blake. When I was getting up for Christmas morning, they were up from being up all night. Have you ever laid in bed? Now, we'll get personal, friend. You ever laid in bed and act like you was asleep because you didn't want your parents to know that you knew what was being said? Have you ever went to a hospital and seen a broken body part? A feeble mom or dad because of the abuse. By the way, do you know in abuse cases, 67% of abuse cases are because of alcohol? Same statistic. Now listen, you have the right to state and believe what you want to believe. But don't be mad at a loving Christian that says, hey, this is what the Bible says, but this is also what this scar right here says. Listen, if I didn't have no physical scars, Brother Keith, I've got enough mental scars. And again, I'm not a perfect man. Matter of fact, in most marriages, there's one person that can usually quote-unquote handle the alcohol, and there's one who can't. One who can get the job done, but the one who can't. And here's what happens. The devil's just playing everybody like a yo-yo because here's why. He or she can't handle it, so they're crazy. So whenever they're pointing the finger at them, they're looking back at them and saying, well, you drink the same drink that I do, so how are you any better than me? Just because you can get up. And friend, until you've ever been there, don't judge that either because it's a true statement. So then the family stays in dysfunction. You want to know why? Because alcohol always brings suffering. You can, Preachers abuse this, and I, I'm not... I'm passionate. I, I, I would argue with you that I'm as passionate as anybody that I know. 
And, and, and I get up there, bless God, blue, 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 you know. But this is a truth. This is the truth. And I truly believe that God still can and God will. I, I, I believe God will take care of us. But I'm telling you, just like I said, God can, God can stop drinking. The Bible tells us, and I, I've got so much scripture that's in here. Jesus can do it, obviously. We know this. If you got to be saved, I'll, I'll tell you that. You know, a, lot, a lot of people say this. Well, I can stop when you get tired of it. No, watch me now. You be tired of it. But every once in a while, I'm, t- I'm tired of doing things. I'm tired of chocolate cake. But after a while, Brother Stephen, I like chocolate cake again. Amen? I'm like, hey, I can get me some chocolate cake again. Amen? You're tired for a season. Some people say, well, I just put the bottle down. It'll be all right. No, friend, you can't do it within yourself. It just don't happen that easy. Some people say it like this. Well, I'm just going to turn over a new leaf. If it was that easy for you to turn over, it's going to be that easy for you to turn it back over. Because here's why. It's the root of that that leads you to it. That stronghold, what it is, when you don't turn to the Lord, you're going to turn to the bottle. Oh, yeah. And can I just say this? Now, my wife is perfect, and I'm not. So I'm just going to say this. Up. Sometimes when we have those heated spiritual conversations, Miss Vicky, you know what I'm talking about? It's hard enough to fix a, a marriage led by the Spirit. Y'all ought to say amen. I mean, y'all ought to help me preach right. I mean, you're like, you walk, walk, you're going to church, living for Jesus. And man, sometimes it's just hard. You're going to add alcohol to it? I have a lot of verses. I, I, this is what I want the invitation to be tonight. I truly believe some of you might not be, and I want you to count, I want you to consider yourself blessed. But if you're here tonight and you've got somebody in your family that's affected by alcohol, don't be judgmental. I want you to love them. I want you to be patient with them. I want you to, I want you to see the root of what makes them pick that bottle up. And pray for that very root for God to be able to jerk it out and let them heal. That way they don't feel like they have to go to that. So tonight, instead of being judgmental, and whatever you do, don't point at your wife or your husband or nobody else. We don't need no confession tonight. This is not a Catholic church and I ain't no priest. Somebody say amen. (laughs) But I'd ask you tonight to pray. You know, I've learned... Tears and love see a lot further than anything else. And if you just love them unconditionally like God loves you. You see that woman back there? It was the love of God in her heart that God used to heal me. She did tell me to be home at 9 (laughs) o'clock. She did tell me this is the line and you don't cross it. She did threaten my life a couple times. But Miss Sarah, she loved me. And she loved me even when I was not perfect. So will you pray tonight for that person? Will you humble yourself and really seek the Lord? Stand to your feet. Heavenly.